welcome to the Southern IPM Hour on Peanut Burrower Bug. Say that five times fast. <laughs> we are um, the Southern IPM Center where we present research issues and programs in integrated pest management from the Southern region through this webinar series. And it usually takes place on the first or second Wednesday of the month at one o'clock Eastern. I'm Kayla Watson, the Communication Director for the Southern IPM Center. And we are housed at both NC State and UGA with a mission to coordinate IPM across the region. We are also one of four regional IPM centers supported by the USDA NIFA Crop Protection and Pest Management Regional Coordination Program. So for the webinar today, if you have any questions for the speaker as we go throughout the talk, um, we may answer those throughout or at the end. So you can type those questions into the Q&A box and that's a little bit different than the chat. The Q&A helps us monitor those and make sure we don't miss any questions. So you can type those in at any time uh, during the talk in your Zoom control panel. We have a couple speakers today, as you can see. Um, uh, Mark Abney is an associate professor of entomology at UGA and his PhD student, Ben Agner, is working with Mark Abney. And they're gonna be talking with us about their ARDP project. And that long title is the development of risk assessment and monitoring tools for peanut burrower bug in southeastern U.S. peanut production. So welcome, Mark and Ben. Looking forward to your presentation. Well, thanks, Kayla. I appreciate uh, you organizing this. And I, I want to say thanks to the Southern IPM Center for giving us a, a venue to present this work. Uh, I'm going to jump right in because, as I mentioned earlier to Kayla, we've been and I probably have more things to say than we have time to say them in. So we're going to get started. And, and what I'm gonna do here to, to begin with is I'm gonna give you some context, right? I'm gonna tell you about the peanut industry in the Southeast US. I'm gonna talk about how we grow peanuts and, and just general, like a Reader's Digest version of integrated pest management in peanuts in the US. And then we're gonna shift into talking about our featured creature, the peanut burrower bug. And I'm gonna tell you some history. I'm gonna tell you what we didn't know about it. And to some extent, what we still don't know. And then I'm gonna shift the reins over to Ben and he's going to talk about what we know now and, and what he has learned and what we have learned through the results of our NIFA funded research. Okay, so, you know, the U.S. peanut industry, I, you know, when you compare it to corn or soybeans, our acreage is not that much, but it ain't peanuts, right? 68% um, of all the peanuts in the United States are grown in the southeast, so that would be Georgia, which, which grows most of the peanuts, and then Florida and Alabama. Uh, and, and for the most part, our pest problems are very similar in, in this region. If you just want to look at Georgia alone, it's a $1.3 billion a year industry. We've got 3,400 some odd farmers just in the state of Georgia, which contributes to the industry about 50,000 jobs. So it's, it's an extremely important crop in Georgia and in the southeast. Um, when you look at worldwide production, if you don't know a lot about peanuts, you know, we, we grow peanuts here in the U.S., but they're grown all over the world, anywhere, basically, that the environment is favorable for them to grow. People grow them. And a lot of folks are surprised to see that we're, no, we're really nowhere near the leader when it comes to volume of peanuts that are produced. We're number four on the list, but we only produce 3% of the peanuts that are grown in the world. And there's a big difference between what a lot of the world grows their peanuts for and what we grow them for. 50% of the production in the world is for oil. China's the number one producer. They, they basically turn all their peanuts into oil. Um, and what's our production for? And this is where if I could see y'all, I would make you answer this question, right? But since I can't see you and I can't hear you, we produce our peanuts in the U.S. mostly for human consumption, right? And in the Southeast, we grow a peanut that's called a runner tyke, okay? And most of those peanuts go into peanut butter. And this is important from a, a pest management perspective. If, if you're growing peanuts for oil, the quality of your crop doesn't matter much, okay? It's refined oil. It doesn't matter if they have insect damage and it may not matter so much what products you use to control pests. But if you're growing peanuts for peanut butter and then think to yourself, who eats most of the peanut butter? Besides me, I eat a lot of peanut butter. The demographics, a lot of children eat peanut butter. So we have kind of a catch 22, right? We don't want insect pests feeding on peanuts and to be more specific, when insects, especially soil insects, feed on the pods, it increases our risk for aflatoxin, which nobody wants to feed to their children, right? So we, we can't have insect damage. And at the same time, we have to be very careful about what products we put on the, on the plant or on the crop because we don't want residues that could be harmful to consumers and especially when those consumers are children, okay? So there's lots of challenges for IPM when it comes to peanuts. All right, talk about 
knowing the crop, right? And some of you may be familiar with this, this piece, this book, The Art of War. It was written by Sun Tzu 600 years before Jesus, right? And I was first introduced to this way back in the 90s in Dr. John All's IPM class at University of Georgia, and I've never forgotten it, and I use it now in my old classes. And Sun Tzu wrote in his book, it is said that if you know your enemies and know yourself, you will not be imperiled in a hundred battles. And as a, you know, a teenager at the University of Georgia or whatever, it's like, okay, what's this guy going on about? But, you know, it's really insightful. And if Sun Tzu, there he is, right? But if he had been an entomologist, I think, this is, this is me, right? If, if Sun Tzu had been an entomologist, he would have probably said something like this. And my apologies to the Mandarin speakers and writers. My best interpretation is know your crops and know your pests. We're, gonna, we're, we're in an IPM symposium webinar here talking about IPM. And if you don't understand the crop and how it grows and you don't understand the pest and its biology and ecology, you're not going to be doing effective IPM. Okay. So with that being said, let's talk about the peanut. And I know I'm talking fast, y'all, but we got a lot of stuff, okay? Peanut, it's, it's a legume, all right? So that means it fixes its own nitrogen when it's in a symbiotic relationship with soil rhizobia. That's a really important thing environmentally. It's a really good crop. We don't have to add a lot of synthetic nitrogen, in fact, none to the peanut crop. It is native to, to South America. So if you want wild peanut ancestors, you would go to South America. Something that's very interesting about this plant is that it flowers above ground but the fruit develop below ground and you, you get outside of the Southeast US and a lot of people don't know that. They think peanuts maybe grow on a tree or at least on a bush. And I'm gonna see, maybe you can see my cursor here, but this botanical drawing up in the top of the screen, you can see that the flower is here, it's above ground. When the pollen sheds, it travels down. The ovary is actually down at the base of the flower. And when, when fertilization occurs, a structure called a pig begins to form. And if you look at this real world picture, you can see all these peanuts, which have been pulled out of the soil. They're all attached to the plant via a peg, okay? Peanuts flower indeterminately. That means, and you can see that in this picture, there's all developmental stages present on that plant at any given time. This also has some really important implications for pest management because as a, as a peanut farmer or as a pest management practitioner, you have to think about, can, can, protecting all those different life stages from a variety of insects that may only want to feed on one particular life stage, whether it's because they become less susceptible as the pods get older, if it's because of the preference of the insect. So there's a lot going on there uh, to pay attention to as you're growing that crop. It's about 140 days from the time we plant peanuts until we harvest them. And that's a long time for a crop that has to be in the ground to be protected from, from insects, okay? So what about pests, right? It's, it may be, I don't know, it's tough for an entomologist to say this, but if you went to any peanut grower in the state of Georgia and you said, tell me what are the most important pests that you have to deal with in peanut, they're almost certainly gonna say that diseases or weeds are number one. And they're probably gonna say diseases are number one. And here's why. If you grow peanuts in the Southeastern United States and you don't manage for diseases, especially fungal diseases here, you will not harvest peanuts. This picture is just of somebody's field trials and you can see where they managed fungal diseases on the, the right and where they didn't on the left and those peanuts are dead. You have to manage diseases. The same thing is true and can be said for weeds. This is a test plot, but they didn't plant these weeds. If we didn't manage weeds in our peanut fields in the state of Georgia, I would venture to say that pretty much 80 to 90% of the fields would look like where you see all that Palmer amaranth, the pigweed in that picture. We can manage diseases very effectively, we can manage weeds very effectively, but if we don't do it, we will not harvest peanuts. When it comes to arthropods, there are fields in the state of Georgia that will not reach economic thresholds with arthropods in any given year. So we don't have to treat every field for insects every year, okay? And that leads to another challenge for pest management, especially insect pest management in peanuts, and that is that because we are making calendar-based sprays, and by we, I mean growers. They're making calendar-based sprays for fungal disease management. They're on a recipe for controlling weeds. It's very easy for them to put an insecticide in the tank with those other treatments and say, well, we're just going to take out the insects that might be present in our fields. And as an extension specialist, my job is to try to work with growers, try to convince them that that's not something that they want to do, because generally speaking, that costs them money that they don't need to spend. All right. So just because insects are not the most important pests 
a peanut does not mean that they're not important, and it does not mean that we will not have significant yield loss if we don't manage them. And I just want to give you some sense for what our major pest complexes are. And these could be, you know, you could you could categorize these things however you want. You could do it taxonomically. But for me, I think thinking about it in terms of foliage feeders, insects that feed on the leaves, and then root and pod feeders, things that are feeding below ground is a good way to look at it. Tobacco thrips is a major pest problem for us. The, the image that you see here is thrips feeding injury. But the big issue is that they transmit tomato spotted wilt virus. And I can talk all day about that too. If somebody wants to hear it, you can uh, invite me back and we'll talk about spotted wilt. Um, lots of different caterpillars. Here's just some examples of the most important ones. Most of them are foliage feeders, but we do have uh, the lesser cornstalk borer, which is our most important economic pest of peanut in the Southeast. Uh, we, we have good ways to manage it. Uh, but if we don't manage it, if we don't scout and treat for this, it can cause significant losses. Um, beetles are really tough. If you work with soil insects before, uh, you realize that we, we don't have a lot of tools for controlling the beetles. And that's true even more so in peanuts than it is in some other crops. The larvae of these insects will feed on the pods and we really have a hard time managing those. Fortunately for us, they're, they're more sporadic than some of our other pests. Um, this is just some, that's some rootworm injury. Spider mites, uh, something you might not think of as being a major peanut problem, but this gentleman is standing in some peanuts that were killed by spider mites. And if you look in the background and see that beautiful green peanut in the background, the only difference between those two areas is irrigation. The peanuts that don't have spider mites were irrigated. And it, for whatever reason in peanuts, irrigated peanuts rarely have spider mite problems. And when it's hot and dry, uh, non-irrigated peanuts are at really high risk. So that gets us to where we're going to be today, and that's the true bugs. We have a couple of true bugs that feed on the foliage that are not really that big a deal. And then we have our, uh, our feature creature, if you will, that the peanut burrower bug. So let's talk about that thing. It's a, it's a hemipteran. It's in the family Sydnidae that just as a group, they're just generally called burrower bugs because that's what they do. Uh, we get confusion from folks. They think, do they burrow into the plant? No, they don't. They burrow through the soil. Um, this one particularly is called Pangeus bilineatus. It's native to the U.S. and as far as any of us know, it's native to Georgia. It's certainly distributed across the state and as, as, as far as anyone knows, it's, it's native here. And it's relatively poorly studied and I don't mean that the studies that have done are bad. I just mean that there, there haven't been a lot of study of this insect. And some of the things we don't know, right, or didn't know, host range, and while we don't have a lot of time to talk about this, a colleague of mine who's now at uh, University of Delaware did gut content analysis while he was a postdoc here at UGA. And it's, it's kind of scary, but this thing eats just about every plant that lives in Georgia, it seems like. Um, they were able to find that in them. So the host range is actually quite, quite wide. And uh, hopefully that paper will come out pretty soon. We didn't know anything about its reproductive biology, uh, chemical ecology. It's very common to see these bugs clustered together in groups. We know they're communicating somehow, but we didn't know how. And then the habitat, uh, where they live, their distribution. All of these things are questions that, that we had coming into this, you know, trying to figure out what is the issue with peanut burrow bug. So we've got this insect and um, it's native. It eats a lot of different things, but what does it do in peanut? And you search the literature and what you'll find is a reference from the 1970s in Texas to peanut burrow bug causing problems in peanut. And then there's some really nice work done in Jay Chapin's lab in the 1990s up at, at Clemson. And, and that's really where most of the literature is on this insect. So it, it's done some damage, but we've grown peanuts in Georgia since the 1800s. We've been the, the nation's leading producer for a very long time. And you can't find a mention of peanut burr bug in the literature as a pest in Georgia uh, between the 1960s and 2010. And something happened in 2010. We had a lot of injury. Uh, and that really was, the, at the time, there was no peanut entomologist here, and that was really the impetus for opening the position and the reason why I was able to move back home. I'm from Georgia. I'm back now. So thank you to the peanut burrow bug for that. Um, they feed directly on the developing seed. So this insect is below ground. I'm going to try to use the, the pointer here. You can see it has a piercing, sucking mouth part. It will feed through the pod wall, through the testa, which has been, the, or seed coat, which has been removed in this case. And you can see everywhere it fed on that seed, it leaves this discolored yellow spot, okay? This, there's, there is a yield effect to this. We, you can reduce yield or see reduced yield when burrow bugs are really heavy, but that's not the main issue, right? The main issue is that it's, a, it's an issue with quality, okay? 
damage varies significantly from year to year and also from field to field. And this is one of the reasons it's so difficult to figure out what's going on. Uh, it's a blessing that we don't have this in every field, but it's also from the standpoint of research, it's very difficult because it's hard to predict where it's going to be. All right, so you might ask yourself, all right, here's this thing. It's, it's, it's not predictable. It, maybe it's sporadic even. It's not in every field. It doesn't affect yield. So what? All right, so when peanuts are harvested, every single load of peanuts is either put into a wagon like this or maybe a tractor trailer, and it's taken to a place called a buying point. All right. At that buying point, you're going to have a third party inspection office. So there's an office that looks something like this. It's going to be employed by people who work for not the farmer and not the buying point. And they're going to inspect those peanuts and look for a variety of things, but insect damage is one of them. Okay. So if peanuts come in and they take a sample, if more than three and a half percent of the peanuts by weight from that sample have burrower bug injury, the grade is reduced from seg one to seg two. All right, what's seg one? Seg one means you can make peanut butter with it. It means you can put it in an M&M or a Snicker bar. It's edible, all right? When that peanut goes seg two, it becomes non-edible. You cannot feed it. You can't make an edible product out of it. It has to be crushed for oil. Peanut prices vary just like anything else. We'll just say on average, a seg one peanut is worth $500 a ton. A seg two peanut is worth $120 a ton. You cannot sustainably grow peanuts in the state of Georgia, if they're at $120 a ton. Uh, just a real quick example, we, we grew peanuts in 2022. In Georgia, we averaged 4,200 pounds an acre. That, this is probably a low estimate, $870 an acre. Production prices are up. This was actually from the previous year's uh, UGA budgets, but we're going to lose $800 an acre selling seg two peanuts. Nobody can stay in business. Um, you're going to go out of business if you have that. So it's a huge issue for growers who have it, right? So when I came to back to the University of Georgia in 2013, one of the main priorities was to develop an IPM program for peanut burrow bug. And I've worked on soil insects for a long time at NC State, and there were some significant challenges that we faced. One of them was we didn't know. What Sun Tzu said, know your enemy and know yourself. Well, we don't know the enemy, right? There's a whole lot about its basic biology that we didn't know. If any good definition of IPM includes monitoring and it includes using thresholds, well, we didn't have a protocol for monitoring this insect. Remember, it's a soil insect and we didn't have economic thresholds. As much as we would love to use tools that don't involve chemistry, chemistry is very often our most effective management tool and we didn't have it, right? Um, for Pyrifos worked, uh, we don't have that now, but it was the only thing that worked, okay? And we didn't know what the risk factors were, so we couldn't predict when or where burrow bug damage would occur. Right? So that led to what the to research that we've done over the last, well, since 2013, really, which focused on improving our knowledge of bugs and biology and ecology, because if we don't know and don't understand the insect's biology, we're really going to be up against it trying to come up with a, an effective IPM program. So I would say that these, these goals are not necessarily the objective of the, the project that Ben's going to talk about. These are really the overarching goals when you look at our burrow bug programmatic area, right? We want to understand those risk factors. We want to develop monitoring tools. We want to identify chemistry. When I say alternative, it's because alternative to chlorpyrifos. And then basically expand management tactics beyond chemistry. Because even, even with a good insecticide, we know that with an insect like this, we're probably not going to get the level of control that we need, and we're going to have to have other tools in our IPM toolbox, All right? So I'm going to go through just a few things here very quickly that we did. Uh, some of this started before the CPPM project. A lot of it went on, continued to go on. It was, it's hard to separate the, the, the two things, right? But a lot of what I'm going to talk about will be things that Ben wasn't directly involved with, even though they were very much tangentially related. Um, and then I'll just give you a really quick summary of what we found. So monitoring and population dynamics, right? We use light traps. We knew that they were attracted to lights. We set up a light trap network in 2015 and that continued on until 2022. Uh, we're looking at one distribution of the insect, abundance over time, and then could we use a light trap as a monitoring tool to make IPM decisions? Uh, you can see anybody that's worked with light traps, this is two nights worth of light trap capture. And the, the burrow bugs in the Petri dish and all the bycatch here, it's a, it was an arduous task to go through all this stuff, okay? 
We also wanted to look at what could we do outside of chemistry, right? So we knew that tillage had some effect on burrow bug from the work that Dr. Chapin had done. This is just one of our own farm trials where we had three different tillage. We had a very aggressive deep tillage. You can see it doesn't get much more aggressive than this. Our growers don't want to do this. This is not compatible with conservation tillage, okay? Um, we had a more conservation tillage approach. This is called a vertical till rig. Uh, it leaves residue on top of the soil when you use it. Um, this would be preferable to deep tillage when it comes to uh, growers using conservation tillage. And then strip till into whatever residue. This would just be fallow. Um, here's an example, very little soil disturbance here. Um, we also looked for effective chemistry, right? This is an, an old Lord's band rig, chlorpyrifos is going out. It works, but there are problems, right? It, it has to be, it either has to be irrigated or it has to rain in order for it to be effective. It tends to be a really, really good at killing beneficials. It'll kill every fire ant in the field. And in three weeks, you will have a caterpillar infestation that you have to control. We did a lot of different things. This is just a picture of peanuts in the daytime. Peanuts will fold their leaves up at night. So we did a lot of nighttime insecticide applications trying to see if we could get the insecticide or active ingredient to the soil where the bugs were. And that's a huge challenge uh, with any soil pest, especially this one. It doesn't feed above ground as far as we know. Um, I put this here because it's so cool. Uh, this is one of those things that you learn and you know, you're looking for an insecticide that will work. We, we got a call to go to a, a, a cotton field that was emerging. And there was little seedling cotton all coming up. And sometimes the seed coat would come up with the cotyledon and fall off. So these are cotton seed coats. And there were literally thousands of peanut burrow bugs dead with their mouth parts stuck in these cotton seed coats. And what we learned was, was this cotton seed was treated with imidacloprid. So there are active ingredients that will kill this insect. And the problem is, how do you get it to them in a peanut field in a way that control them in the middle of the growing season? We also looked at host plant resistance. This is important because over 80% of the runner type peanut acres in the Southeast are a single cultivar. And that's Georgia 06G. That 06 means it was released in 2006, all right? By the time it became widely cultivated in, in Georgia in the Southeast around 2010, if you remember a few minutes ago, I said 2010 is when this insect became a major problem. Coincidence, I don't know but it certainly raises the question of whether or not host plant resistance could be at play and that this may be a more susceptible cultivar. And we looked at a lot of different ones, not just the ones on the screen, but um, we'll talk about a little bit of that in a second. So to summarize all of that in one slide, so we talked about monitoring and distribution. Peanut burrow bug was everywhere all the time. If we put up a light trap in Georgia, we caught peanut burrow bugs. If it was warm enough for them to be active, we caught them. All right, the abundance varied significantly. They could be high levels in one place, low levels in another, but it was everywhere. From the standpoint of, of could we use that for monitoring, for, for management, the light trap capture did not correlate well to injury. So if there were lots of bugs, we caught lots of bugs, but sometimes we would see injury where we didn't catch high numbers of bugs, okay? Tillage matters, deep tillage reduces damage. Um, it's the only tool growers have right now. None of the insecticides we tested provided consistent adequate injury reduction, even though we know they're active ingredients that will kill this insect. It's a very difficult test, pest to target with an insecticide, right? And in our studies, none of the host plant resistance that we saw, we did see some variation in susceptibility, but nothing that was good enough to be able to say, grow this variety or cultivar and you won't have injury. All right, so now that leads us to, after all that, to, to what Ben's going to talk about, and that's our project that was funded by the NIFA CPPM program. And I just quickly, I'm going to acknowledge our collaborators here, Dr. Scott Mumford here at UGA in Crop and Soil Science, Alana Jacobson and Ayan Abba Majumdar at, at Auburn University, and then Ajahn Zhang, who did help us with our pheromone stuff that Ben will talk about from USDA, Glenn Rains here at, in the entomology department at UGA. And... The key objectives that Ben's going to talk about, he's going to talk about our efforts to identify risk factors, trying to develop some sort of a risk assessment tool for growers. Uh, we wanted to identify chemical attractions. That's what Dr. Zhang helped us with, trying to, we knew there was probably a pheromone. He's helped us do that. And then increasing, just generally increasing our knowledge of pest biology and ecology, and hopefully that we could exploit that for uh, pest management. I'm going to hand the keyboard over to Ben and let him take it from here. 
All right. Thanks, Mark. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm just going to roll right through and uh, reiterate the overarching goal of this aspect of the project was to identify landscape and local environmental factors that could uh, potentially be driving uh, peanut burrower bug injury to peanut. And uh, we're hopeful that in doing this, we can uh, develop a risk assessment tool for peanut farmers. And so to better understand risk um, associated with, uh, with landscape and environment, um, we started with landscape complexity, and this can be broken into two uh, broad categories. Uh, the first landscape composition, which is the proportion of uh, land cover land use types within a specific extent. Uh, in this case, uh, our extent were our extents were one and one and a half kilometers. And then the other part of landscape complexity is landscape configuration, uh, which is the arrangement or pattern of those land cover types in in the uh, surrounding area. And this can be thought of as the connectedness of specific uh, habitat types that are relevant to our study organism. And there's a lot of literature out there that um, reinforces the, the theory that landscape complexity has a strong influence on pest abundance and distribution, which subsequently um, has a direct correlation with injury to crops. And so this figure represents our data pipeline. Uh, we had a lot of data in this and the majority of my time on this project was spent managing data um, and, uh, and getting it into a proper format so that we could use it. And so our land use and soil data came from the USDA. Our injury data came from uh, the inspection facilities all across the state of Georgia. Climate data came from the PRISM Climate Group at Oregon State, and our elevation data came from the USGS Digital Elevation Model. So we created a database of all the peanut burrow bug injured peanuts in Georgia for, uh, for these three years. Uh, each of them contained thousands of records. And so we input those data into Excel, compiled and compressed those data by farm and calculated the response variable that we used for the study, which was kilograms of injured peanuts per hectare. We then georeferenced those sites at, um, with the cropland data layer and Google Maps and categorized those fields uh, with and without irrigation. And uh, after all that, we had a total of 442 total sites for the you know, for the analysis. Um, and this is really a remarkable sample size. Uh, just to give you an idea, generally for studies like this, you see sample sizes between in 10, uh, 10 and 40 fields. So, um, so this sample is, is really special. Um, so here's a list of the potential predictors that we looked at. And to simplify the modeling process, I separated these into uh, these three categories of landscape composition, landscape configuration, and then environmental variables. Uh, within composition, we're looking at um, land cover types that are relevant to our species. So uh, peanut and cotton especially, and then all of these others that you see here, uh, which include hab habitat diversity indices and so on. Um, within the configurational variables, we um, we're looking at, um, you know, interface of those specific crop types that are relevant uh, to semi-natural habitat. Also, uh, field size, things like edge density of uh, different crop families, and so on. And then, of course, within the environmental ca category, looking at precip precipitation, temperature, and uh, soil composition. So uh, the, the analysis was performed in R using generalized linear models. And I started uh, with uh, individual annual models and then ultimately combined all of those data and ended up with a global model of all years combined. And um, we, we started by testing Poisson and quasi-Poisson distributions. Uh, those data were over dispersed. So we landed on a neg negative binomial distribution. Again, the, the response variable we used was kilograms of injury per hectare. And I, um, I, I started by, uh, again, separating those, um, those independent variables by category to simplify 
the modeling process and also to um, uh, to um, uh, ensure that I wasn't including collinear variables within the same model and also not combining independent variables that had opposing uh, relationships with injury. Um, and so uh, this is just to give you a, a visualization of the, um, of the, the variables that we found to be significant in our model and the distribution of those data. And the strongest relationships we saw were with uh, injury and crop habitat richness, uh, field size, and also um, precipitation and soil organic material. Uh, we also unsurprisingly saw a change in the amount of injury in the year 2018 uh, when compared to the years uh, 16 and 17. So here's just another depiction of those data. On the left, you can see the significant predictors that we had in our final model and the correlation co coefficients associated with those. Uh, other agriculture includes any crop type that was not peanut cotton or woody crops. Uh, crop richness refers to the number of species um, of crops within our study extent. Non-crop richness is the number of non-crop species within our study extent. Peanut field area is the size of the peanut field. Edge density in this case refers to the edge density of contrasting uh, crop families. Average roughness is a measure of the change of elevation within a field. Uh, precipitation here refers to the cumulative number of days where any amount of rain fell. And um, the uh, soil organic material refers to the amount of organic material uh, in the soil there. Uh, and that uh, uh, relates directly to um, water capacity and water retention within the soil. Um, also, you'll see over uh, on the right side, the, the pseudo-R squared value is a, a really important statistic and that gives us an idea of uh, how much variation we're predicting with these significant variables in that model. And at first glance, at first glance, you might think uh, pseudo R squared of 2.26 does not seem that great, but um, this means that we're predicting 26% amount of the variation observed, uh, which is actually pretty good uh, for a study like this. Um, that said, there is certainly room for improvement. So uh, just to highlight a few key findings here, uh, Within the compositional variables, we saw uh, high crop richness is correlated with high injury, and this could be due to the availability of alternate host plants for both peanut burrower bug and, um, and its natural enemies. Um, and how those, uh, those um, crops could potentially be affecting um, these uh, respective, the respective movement of those groups into and out of peanut. Uh, a key finding for uh, configuration was that we saw large field area is co uh, correlated with low injury. Um, this could be due to potentially a resource dilution effect, or um, also we know in South Georgia in large fields, there's a lack of uniformity with soil type and elevation. Uh, and these factors could potentially be hindering the movement of burrow bugs uh, throughout those fields. And then, again, for our, environment, our, environment, our environmental variables, uh, cumulative days of rain were correlated with low injury and, uh, um, and also soil organic material was correlated with uh, low injury as well. And these, these things could, um, these actually reinforce uh, a theory that we have um, where we're seeing higher injury in dry areas or during periods of drought throughout the state. So how valuable is this for the grower? Well, um, ultimately, again, we'd like to turn this into a, a risk, this these information we'd like to turn into a risk assessment tool, um, which could help a grower identify those high risk areas, either prevent them from uh, planting in those areas, or if they ultimately have to plant in those areas, they can mark those high-risk peanuts and keep them separate from their low-risk peanuts to ensure the quality of their peanut loads 
um, as they um, process through the inspection point. Um, and again, like I said before, there's there's room for improvement uh, with with this model, and so including things like uh, field production practices, which we we think are likely to have an effect on peanut burrow or bug abundance and injury, uh, including these types of factors could help us uh, improve our uh, predictive um, outcomes. So I'm going to switch gears here and talk about the work we've done to identify uh, chemical attractants to the species. And um, really the goal of this work is to uh, find something that we can, uh, that we know is attractive to the bug so that we can facilitate our monitoring capabilities and um, hopefully in, uh, implement maybe an attract and kill strategy or make a uh, mating disruption strategy. And so Dr. Aizhen Zhang at the USDA has been tasked with uh, pheromone discovery and synthesis. And he sent us target compounds to test in the field and lab at UGA. And uh, really, we're just trying to determine if these experimental compounds were attractive to, uh, to our species. And so Dr. Zhang's lab did identify and synthesize a putative male-produced pheromone and supplied our lab with these. Uh, to test in the field and lab. For the field evaluation, we, um, we set out these compounds in various trap types over multiple locations and years. And for the lab bioassay aspect of this, um, we tested these compounds in a Y-tube olfactometer. So unfortunately, none of the compounds tested showed a high level of attractiveness in the field, even when we placed those in fields that we knew had high peanut burrow bug abundance. And so we brought these compounds back to the lab and tested those five experimental compounds uh, in the olfactometer. And I added three live bug treatments, um, separately consisting of male, female, and, uh, and nymphs. And we test the response of males, females, and, and nymphs to each of those treatments. Um, so here's a close up of my olfactometer system. Uh, a lot of time went into finding all of the necessary components for this and, um, and then troubleshooting the system. Uh, but uh, this, is, this is the final, uh, the final product there. And so, um, the results of our lab bioassay uh, showed that treatment four was attractive to females and appeared to repel males. Uh, treatment two was our blank control. And we also saw that females were attracted to nymphs and female adults in the uh, olfactometer. And so what's next with this? Well, we know that we can't develop an effective pheromone-based monitoring tool without an effective lure. And uh, given the lack of uh, significant results in the field, we, we need the optimization of those current compounds or to explore other compounds uh, in, order to, um, in order to go forward with that. Um, we do know that unbaited pitfall traps have been developed and used successfully in the field for monitoring populations and uh, making treatment decisions. However, with the revocation of food tolerances for chlorpyrifos, that's no longer uh, a relevant strategy. Um, I said I wouldn't interrupt, man, but I'm going to interrupt him just for a second because I'm sure somebody's thinking, well, you just, all these treatment four and treatment two, what's, what is the compound? What's its structure? And there's issues with, uh, with patents and things in Eisen's lab, and so we can't show them to you. Sorry. Go ahead, Neil. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to uh, switch gears again and uh, talk to you guys about the work that we've done to gain a better understanding of peanut burrow bi biology and behavioral ecology to facilitate the development of IPN tactics and strategy. And um, so I'm going to focus on studies we've conducted to determine uh, peanut burrow bug fecundity and female longevity, uh, determination of uh, the number and duration of immature life stages, morphometric determinant of life stage, and to investigate the parental role in nymph development. And so I've divided this section of the talk into two broad categories. Under developmental biology, I'll talk about fecundity and female longevity. 
the number and duration of life stages, uh, morphometric determinant of life stage by a head capsule width. And uh, I've tested this in accordance with the theory that um, arthropod species express geometric progression of growth between molts. Um, and that's, uh, that's also known as brooks Steyer's law. And then under behavioral ecology, I'll talk about some studies I've conducted to investigate uh, parental investment. And so all the bugs for these studies were re reared in the laboratory. And all of these studies were done in an environment chamber at constant conditions, very warm, very humid, and a, a long day length representative of uh, summertime in South Georgia. And so to investigate fecundity and female longevity, I paired one virgin male and one female in each of 16 classic containers. I cycled those daily. Um, and into, I cycled the adults daily into uh, new containers with fresh soil. And so each day I sampled the um, uh, containers from the previous day and I collected the amount of eggs per day, total eggs per female, the overposition period, and the longevity of females. And uh, for the statistical analysis, I tested for variance between reps and also tested for a location effect in the growth chamber uh, with ANOVA. And so um, the females laid an average of 129 eggs uh, over their um, overposition period of an average of 62 days. Um, the, um, the greatest number of eggs were were laid at the beginning of the overposition period and gradually de decreased until the bug's death. And um, uh, females lived an average of 62 days, um, or excuse me, no, 90 days. I'm sorry, I've got something blocking my, <laughs> but my view of the slide. Sorry, so yeah, average lifespan of, of females was, uh, was about 90 days. Um, and this, um, reinforced what we have seen in our laboratory colony. So for, for studying the number and duration of life stage, I, um, I set up an experiment very similar to the, the previous one, except I paired three adults in each container, uh, each of 72 containers. Um, and, and after they had enough time to mate and lay eggs, I removed all of those adults and added a single virgin female to facilitate normal development of the nymphs. And I'll talk more on that in a, a minute, but um, each day I randomly selected eight containers to sample and recorded the number of bugs, the development stage uh, of each, and the date. And I also did a very st similar statistical analysis to test for variance between reps and also uh, for a location effect uh, using ANOVA. So to answer the question of how many life stages, the, uh, this, um, the answer was five immature life stages. And you can see each of those pictured on the right-hand side of the slide. Um, and the duration of development lasted 3.7 to 8.1 days per, uh, per nymphal life stage. First and second instars lasted very similar uh, around four days and then, um, and then um, duration gradually increased with life stage. The incubation period lasted about 11 days and the mean total duration from overposition to adult lasted about 40 days. Again, reinforcing what we've seen in our lab uh, colony. So to, um, to uh, study the, the morphometric determinant of, determine of, excuse me, to uh, determine whether we could um, identify life stage by, um, by head capsule width, I photographed and measured each life stage with uh, uh, with this microscope pictured here and a LASIK software package and measured the distance from the outer edge of each eye. And for the statistical analysis, I fit regression models and then I plotted life stage to head capsule width. Um, and for the, um, 
to t test for accordance with Brooks Dyer's law, I logged transformed head capsule width and plotted those data to the presumed life stage. And so, um, so the answer to our question, yes, we can predict life stage by measuring the, the width of the head capsule. Um, and uh, we got really consistent data uh, for those measurements, as you can see here. And um, this chart depicts the, uh, the log of the mean head capsule width. And in order to, um, in order to say that, that yes, we, uh, the species expresses geometric progression of growth, each of those dots is supposed to fall along that dotted line, which they do. Any deviation from that line would indicate that we've either misidentified one of our uh, life stages or, um, or the species does not uh, express geometric progression of growth. So early on in my program, when I was thinking of ideas um, and trying to figure out how to monitor the development of, of NIMS, I, I, I initially had isolated NIMS in the petri dishes and um, and they would not develop out of the first instar. So uh, this got me thinking, um, well, maybe they they're they're getting something from either uh, the other nymphs or or the males or the females. And so in order to test whether or not males, females, or nymphs were having an effect on the bug's development, I developed this experiment. With, uh, with nine treatments of either uh, no adult present, a virgin female or a virgin male present, and also each of those with one, two, or four eggs. And so I set up an experiment with 20 grams of soil and one ounce solo cups and um, uh, placed eggs in each of those cups and monitored their development over a period of 21 days. And I performed an OVA and t-test to identify differences between those treatments. And so um, I found that, yes, nymphs only develop in the presence of females. Uh, we had a significantly higher number, of, a higher number of bugs developed to subsequent instars when paired with a female. You can see in the top chart there. And, um, and also in the bottom chart, the, the level of mortality was much higher when, um, when the bugs were not paired with a female. And so the next question was, well, why is female presence required for the bugs to develop? So I, I, I set up another experiment to uh, kind of home in on, um, on that. And uh, this, this experiment had five treatments, one with no adult, one with a live female and um, with, with contact allowed, uh, a live female with no contact allowed, a dead female with contact, and a dead female without contact. And the live or dead females were placed in either A or B of these homemade arenas um, to, uh, you know, pr to prevent um, uh, interaction between each of those with the freshly hashed uh, nymphs. And so again, I, um, I, counted the number of bugs in each container after a period of 22 days and performed the same uh, statistical analysis on this experiment. And so, uh, so yeah, we answered this question that yes, the, the nymphs need direct contact with a female for proper development. And the top chart, um, the, the brown bars represent first instar nymphs. And so you can see um, there were very few left in the live female contact a treatment and um, and most of the bugs that were still alive in the other treatments at the end of the experiment had not developed out of the first instar. Um, and again, we saw a very high percent mortality with all of the treatments that did not have live female uh, contact. And so in summary, the mean total eggs uh, produced by each female was 129 over a period of about 62 days. And the mean lifespan of females was about 90 days. A peanut burrow bug developed through five influence stars over a uh, over position period of about 40 days. We can predict head capsule width with life stage um, and there are management implications with that. Um, we can, uh, for example, we can go collect a sample from the field 
collect those data on head capsule width and predict the um, you know when uh, the next generation might appear, um, and so that we can better target our interventions. And uh, we also found the nymphs need a female present to develop properly. And this is kind of probably like the coolest aspect of what I've done. And um, we're, we don't really know how to answer why or how that is yet, but, um, but this, it, it's really opened the door for a lot of uh, opportunity for, uh, for research in the future. So with that, I'm going to kick it back over to Mark and uh, he'll give you some final thoughts on, on these things. Yeah, thanks, Ben. I mean, you know, it's very clear that there's factors that influence burrow bug abundance and injury, right? And, and a lot of people looked at this in a lot of different ways before we started doing it systematically through experimentation, right? And people in the peanut industry are not dumb and no one can figure out the pattern. It's like, it's not just, it's just not just non-irrigated field. It's not just fill it fields it with uh, conservation tillage. It's not, there's no one thing. And so it, it's a complicated deal. Yes, we've learned a lot, right? We, we've learned a lot about what influences burrow bug injury. Ben was right to talk about the production practices and their influence. And, you know, do, would I like to be sitting here today with a risk assessment tool? Absolutely, I would. Are we there yet? No. Are we still going to continue to work on that? Is that still a go? Absolutely. Yes, it is. Um, and I think we can do it. Um, I think the, you know, with the chemical ecology, we, you know, we were pretty certain that it's communicating with some sort of chemical. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on with this bug. The thing that Ben just talked about just fascinates the hell out of me, really. Um, the whole idea with the, the female being present. But I still think there's opportunities for, for maybe being able to monitor this thing if we can tweak that uh, compound or if we find another compound. Uh, I think that there's a lot of potential for host plant resistance. We've got a lot of work going on here at UGA with our uh, scientists looking at uh, wild hosts, of, or wild, not hosts, but wild ancestors of peanuts. And with marker assisted breeding, I think if we put the effort into it, I think we can probably come up with a peanut that's more resistant to burrow bug. Right now, it's a really tough situation for our growers. Uh, tillage is the only thing that they have. Uh, again, Ben mentioned, we, we came up with a really nice monitoring tool with our pitfall traps. It was really, it was cheap, it was easy, it worked. And when we lost chlorpyrifos, there's no reason to monitor now because there's no tool that a grower can implement to manage it. Uh, and as much as we would like to say, we, we wanna manage this thing without chemistry, we need some effective chemistry. Our growers need it. Uh, we've learned a lot. I mean, we've learned a lot about burrow bug biology and ecology. And I, again, we could talk all afternoon. There's a lot of stuff we weren't able to include, but there's still a whole lot that we need to learn. Uh, and let's see, Ben, hit, hit the go ahead there. And that, you know, that's going to wrap us up. But I want to make sure that, you know, to thank everybody who participated today. I especially, you know, we can't do this without funding. And the the money from the USDA NEFA CPPM was absolutely, I mean, it, that's what paid Ben essentially. And that's what got the pheromone work done. We could not have done it without them. The, we're, we're blessed to have uh, growers who are very engaged. The National Peanut Board, Georgia Peanut Commission helped fund some of the work we talked about. My lab's had a lot of people come through it and they've all been really good helping us out. And I, I absolutely, I know we're about out of time, but I have to mention Mike Crossley and Jason Schmidt and Aresh Kierden because uh, I don't know how many of you on here know me, but the landscape level analyses that Ben is talking about, I don't know how to do. And those three people have been just, you know, they've been over backwards and been extremely uh, generous with their time with Ben, helping him learn, because he didn't know how to do it either, right? He's had to learn this stuff from scratch, which is really tough. So my hat's off to them. Huge thank you to them. And uh, again, I appreciate y'all being here. If we got any questions we, and y'all got time, we'd be happy to try to answer them. Well, thanks so much for your presentation, guys. Um, great job, great work. and. You know, I, I think it's really important that people realize that partnerships, like you just mentioned, matter because you can't know how to do everything. But having good people on your team is really, really important and knowing who those people are. So that's really awesome that you were able to work together to get um, this project off the ground and, and parts of it that you wouldn't have been able to do by yourself. So it's really awesome work. Um, we do have a bunch of questions coming in. Awesome. And uh, I'm thinking... I'm going to start with this one because it may be simpler. <laughs> Do you see any potential biological control options? 
Yeah, that's a, that is a, it's, it's kind of simple. Yeah, you know, you never know, right? We have seen there's a there's a um, a fungal pathogen that we picked up on that is we had it. I, I, did we get it finally identified? Was it a new what um, status on that man? Yes, it was identified, and I I um, initially it was identified incorrectly okay um, so well, and i i remember the incorrect identification okay, but well, i i'd have to go back and check on uh on the actual correct identification. well the short answer is this i, I don't think that it's gonna I, I don't know how we could do it right this thing it's adapted to live here it's a native species it coexists with all of its whatever biocontrol natural enemies that are there it coexists with it and i don't know if we you know we disrupt our uh agricultural land so much maybe we're disrupting some sort of natural control that if we didn't do that if we figured out what it was and we didn't do it maybe but you know there there's a lot of soil pathogens that could affect this thing we, we've seen one um there's a strepsipterin that's a parasitoid and you know we i've actually never seen it in all the light trap bugs that i've looked at i've looked for it because i wanted to see it because it's in the literature it's really cool but i've never seen it um so, you know, it's got natural enemies. I, I mentioned fire ants at one point. I see this thing a lot associated with fire ants, and I don't know if the fire ants aren't helping it. Um, I don't know how, but I know I, when I see uh, burrower bugs, there's almost always fire ants around, and they don't seem to be preying on them. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know the answer. I think that I wouldn't rule anything out, but I don't, I don't see biocontrol as being a, a, something that we're going to be able to tap into uh, to really help our growers in the near future, unfortunately. Gotcha, well, thank you. And Mark, you mentioned things like tillage came up quite a bit um, and cultivars, but what about planting date? How might that affect the risk? Yeah, so this is an interesting bug because, I mean, it is native and it, it doesn't, it can overwinter in peanut fields, but it can overwinter practically anywhere, right? Um, and it overwinters in the soil. And I have not seen any effect of plant date, and we've looked at that. Um, and I think one reason is that the insect migrates in and out of the field. It's we we don't normally plant peanuts two years in a row in Georgia. That's not something that we recommend from an agronomic standpoint. But we have done it chasing burrower bugs. So we had fields that were heavily infested one year, and then we would plant peanut in it again, trying and and those infestations disappeared for no reason that we you know, for, we you know they just went away. We didn't get injury the second year, and so. I have not seen an impact of plant date, um, and I think it's the bug is the adult is it is a soil insect, but it's highly mobile. It can fly. It does fly. I don't know what it. Do, I don't know how it migrates or why it migrates, but it can move around. And fields that weren't infested one year can be infested the next, and vice versa. And so, um, I don't know. It's a it's a great question because it's one of the things that you always think of, especially with a soil insect rotation and plant date are really like key questions that you ask yourself and we've not seen any issues with plant date and very little with crop rotation. Gotcha. Okay. And then um, the same person, David, is wondering how comparable would the risk tool being developed for the burrower bug differ compared with the southern corn rootworm tool used in the BC region? Well, it depends, right? It could be very similar. Um, and that tool, if you're not familiar with it, it there's this, I mean, they, they understand, they, they identified risk factors associated with rootworms. And you can go on the website and you're assigned, your field is assigned a certain number of points based on the conditions, right? Whether or not it uh, has a history of rootworm infestation and then soil texture. And at some point you get to a certain number of points and they recommend that you treat prophylactically for rootworm. And it could be very similar to that, right? I mean, uh, we're not to the point where we can tell someone to treat prophylactically based on the model that we have, right? We can say that this field is at higher risk, but even if we had an insecticide, I wouldn't recommend a prophylactic or preventive treatment based on the, the model. It, it can tell you you're at high risk, but it's not good enough to say that those high risk fields are going to be infested at a level that would cause economic injury, not at this point anyway. But yeah, it could be, it could look very much like that. And I, could, and I would envision it looking very much like that rootworm model. Great question. Gotcha. Well, um, that that's all the questions I'm seeing. There were some more from uh, Clayton Myers, who you might recognize. Um, he's the 
chief entomologist at the Office of Pest Management Policy. He has to leave right at two o'clock. So just let me know. He's going to be emailing you some questions later that he has about, okay. about this project. Okay, great. Um, so if you had to leave the people here with um, some final thoughts and things that you want them to remember, either about the bug or about your project or IPM in general, uh, what would your final thoughts be? Well, I'm only going to be partially facetious when I say that soil insect work is hard, right? Um, and it's it's difficult to get the kind of data that you need. Um, that we're chasing an insect that's sporadic, um, and you know I, we would like to be farther along with a, a true man something else to do to manage this insect from the standpoint of helping our growers, and we're not there. Ben mentioned the quality of the data set we have. We have a tremendous data set because we have for several years we have virtually a record of every peanut field in the state of Georgia that was injured that had burrow bug injury and then we have all these factors that you know that he pulled down off of all these different data layers and you know for someone that would be interested Ben's going to finish right and he's going to go away but if this is in your bailiwick I, and you would be interested I think someone who can do these kinds of analyses if they might be interested in looking at you're talking about collaborations right I'm willing to share these data with somebody. Um, there's there's multiple publications in these data that could be mined out, right? I mean, there's a lot of stuff here, uh, and I don't have the expertise to do it myself. And so, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm throwing that out there as an invitation to folks that if, if this is your area of expertise, uh, we've got some data you might be interested in looking at. And there's, like Ben said, you know, a lot of these studies have 40 field sites, and we've got 442 field sites with this full with a full set of data with all the information that, that's in it. And so um yeah, burrow bug stuff, it's it's we're fortunate it wasn't a bad problem in 2022, but we can't predict what it's going to be like in 2023. We really need some we need tools, we need help from industry. Uh I mean I know that's not the our audience here, but we we really do need help from industry with some and and probably from EPA as well. And we we need for the tools to be approved when, when they come when they become available. So um, I guess that's probably about it. Good to know. No, that's great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kayla. All right, thank y'all.